you probably had this experience at at least elementary school. You had civil defense drills, and then you had just regular air raid drills. Do you remember those? What did you do during an air raid drill? You had to go under your desk. Under your desk, and you had to put your hands behind your head. Now remember, at Cocky Soul Elementary, now known as Warren Apartments, you, could not wear, you couldn't wear pants to school if you were a girl until sometime in the 70s. So we all had dresses on, sometimes with crinoline. So if you can imagine with your head down and your hands behind your head and your skirt over your, well, it's not a pretty picture. We didn't know why we did this. And in civil defense drills, you went down into the basement and saw the big bin of water that had been there since 1945 and the crackers that had been there since Jesus served communion on the side of the hill with the fish and the bread. Now, when we were sitting there on the floor doing all these drills, 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 it was during the Cold War. That was the reality that I grew up in, the Cold War. And those of you who are baby boomers remember that, always living in some sort of level of fear. But one day we said to the teacher, somebody raised their hand and said, why is it that we do this? Her answer still rings in my ears. She said, this is for when, not if, this is for when they drop an atomic bomb on the school. So you'll be protected. Right. It was part of a bigger program called what? Duck and cover. If you see the flash of the nuclear explosion, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to duck and cover. They had these great little PSA films. My favorite was this kid. You know, he's walking along and he sees this flash and he jumps off his bicycle and he goes to a picnic table and he pulls the picnic tablecloth over his head and that's going to protect him from the nuclear blast. We know that doesn't really work, don't we? Now, you may be wondering, why in the world is she talking about nuclear war during a Pentecost sermon? I want you to hold the image of ducking and covering for a while. We'll get back to it, I promise you. But first, I want us to look at what we read this morning from John's Gospel. Again, we're in what's called the final discourse. John's last teaching with his disciples. He's washed their feet. They've had a last meal. Not the institution of Holy Communion like in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But they're there together. He's teaching them what he wants them to really remember before he leaves them. What did he say to them? I'm giving you a new commandment. And what was that commandment? You've heard it week after week after week recently. I'm giving you a new commandment that you what? Love one another. The only way they'll know that you're my disciples is if you have love for one another. And then he promises that another advocate is coming. Another, meaning Jesus himself was the advocate. Now, if you thought nuclear war was a great way to start a sermon, let's do a little Greek. Anybody here speak Biblical Greek or read Biblical Greek? I don't. What am I raising my hand for? Mark's like, yeah, a little bit. But I bet you all know this word or you've heard it before. The paraclete. Not the parakeet, not the bird in the cage at your house. Not the parasol that you should have out here if you were sitting in the sun this morning. Not even a parachute, but the paraclete is the word that is translated in John's Gospel as advocate. An advocate. What is an advocate? Literally, the word paraclete means someone who is called to come alongside someone else. Someone who is called to come alongside someone else. Anybody here ever learned to ride a bicycle when you were a little kid? How many of you had a parent running along beside you holding you up once the training wheels were off? That's an advocate. That is who Jesus Christ is for us, the one who keeps us safe. Because do you remember the first time you rode by yourself without the training wheels and you were wobbly? Wasn't it nice to have someone running along, panting beside you, trying to hold up the bike in case you fell until you suddenly took off and soared? That is who the Holy Spirit is for us, the Spirit of God the Father, the Spirit of God the Creator, who is also the Spirit of Jesus the Christ. The word also has other meanings, counselor. Mark is a professional counselor, but you've all either gone to a counselor or counseled someone else. Someone who takes the time to sit down and really listen to you. Counselors do not give you lip service. Counselors do not let your troubles go in one ear and out the other. A counselor is someone who takes your troubles to heart, takes your troubles into their lives and offers you counsel and wisdom and a way to make it through. That's who the Holy Spirit is for us. Comforter. Oh my golly, have we needed a comforter this year? Anybody here use a little comfort? Not the kind of comforter you keep on your bed, but it's the same idea. Something that wraps you in warmth and security and makes you feel less afraid. That is who Jesus is for us. That is who the Holy Spirit is going to be for us. 
in the promise John, in John's gospel that Jesus makes to his disciples. The defender. Defender in a physical sense, but mostly defender in a legal sense. If you've ever gone to court, if you've ever been sued or charged with a crime, you need someone who is there to defend you. That is what the Holy Spirit is going to do for us in the name of Jesus our Savior. And an intercessor. Another way to translate paraclete, another way it's inter it is translated is intercessor. Someone who prays for you. I tell you the truth, I can always tell when people are praying for me. I feel power when people are praying for me. I've told you all about Miss Betty, who's one of my favorite parishioners of all time. She prayed for me every day in the morning and the evening. When she died, I felt that loss of light in my life. I felt the power of her prayer that had been there no longer there, and other people found out and said, I'm going to pray for you like Betty did now. Now, an intercessor, someone who prays on your behalf, someone who prays for your health, your safety, your well-being, someone who prays for your heartaches and your burdens and all those other things. Um, this week I needed prayer, and my little group in the morning prays for me, and I had a migraine that went on for three days, which is why the sermon title didn't get in the bulletin, and I also left out the lesson from Romans, but I'm going to read it to you because there was another lesson this morning that got left out from the 8th chapter of Romans, which is my favorite chapter in the entire Old and New Testaments together. The Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures, my favorite is the 8th chapter of Romans. This is from verses 22 through 27. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. I never went through labor. Anybody here go through labor? Let me hear a groan of labor. Oh, you're not going to do it here, are you? Because you're going to pretend you didn't do it then. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. When you don't even know how to pray, and how many times have we not known what to pray? I can't tell you how many times people have come to me when their loved one is in their last hours. They don't know what to pray for. They said, I just feel guilty if I pray that God would take this person. I'm praying for his life to end. If I pray for God to keep him here, that's being selfish. I don't know how to pray. This is the verse that I always share with them. When you don't know how to pray, you have a Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Creator, the Spirit of God, the Christ, interceding for you with groans too deep for words, groans that God can understand in God's heart. Isn't it good that God is groaning on our behalf because we all don't speak the same language? There are some people who interpret the Pentecost story as the reversal of the Tower of Babel, when God spread people because they were trying to get, they were trying to build this tower to get too close to God to be like God, which has always been our problem as human beings. We want to be like God. We want to have that sort of knowledge and power and authority. But this is not the reversal of the tower where people were scattered to speak different languages so they can no longer understand each other. This is God saying, I don't care what language you speak, you're part of my family. I want you near me. Which is why the disciples were given the ability to speak not in glossolalia, not in a prayer language, which is how some people only interpret the speaking of tongues and the gift of tongues. This was they were able to speak in other languages because the Spirit allowed them, because they wanted to communicate the gospel. And people were amazed because they heard it and they were thinking, how can I be hearing this? I don't I don't know their language. Remember, these are the fishermen. These are the tax collectors. These are the followers, this little ragtag bag of people that Jesus had picked up along the way. They weren't educated. They didn't know how to read or write, probably, more than to make the necessary arrangements for the cost that they charged for the fish that they caught. But here they are, speaking in the languages of the whole world, because there were Jews living all over the world, the diaspora, those who had not come back after the exile. But they'd taken their faith with them, and they come to Jerusalem for this celebration of Pentecost. They come to listen to the story of Ruth, of all the stories in the scripture. That's the one that Jews read at their Pentecost celebration. 
They're listening to the stories, but they're hearing the gospel proclaimed in the language of each. We get a little funny about language, don't we? We've got people who say English only here. I'm not a fan of English only, mostly because I worked in a deaf congregation and I had to fingerspell Phrygia and Pamphylia and all those things as the lesson went by very quickly. But because we are called to love and serve one another regardless of race or nation or place of origin or language that we speak. Back a few years ago, I took pastoral Spanish at Notre Dame University of Maryland. Um, I drove from West Virginia once a week to take that class because there were so many Spanish-speaking people living in my area. People in my congregation, some of them were a little upset with me. They said, if they're here, they should learn English. Try to learn English as a second language. It is not easy, folks. It is not easy at all. Spanish, the verb, the vowel sounds are a-a-e-o-u, not a a a a a all those sounds that we make. It's a lot easier to learn. And someone said to me, why are you going to bother to learn Spanish when they should be learning English? I said, so I can help people learn English so they can function here better, and also because I need to share the gospel. I have a burning passion in my heart to share the gospel. I don't care what language it's in. And if you look at Epworth, look at the number of people who are part of our congregation for whom English is a second language. But the spirit of God that lives and works through our congregation has brought us all together here. Speaking of Spanish-speaking people, there is a Brazilian theologian. He's a professor at Union Theological Seminary, which is part of Columbia University in New York City. His name is Claudio Calvarajes, if I said that right. He wrote a commentary on this lesson that I read for this morning, and it stuck with me, this line more than anyone. To experience Pentecost, it is necessary to search for change and to allow ourselves to be changed. Now, that's, let me read that again so you get that. To experience Pentecost, it is necessary to search for change and to allow ourselves to be changed. We don't like to be changed, do we? We're kind of set in our ways. I tell you what, we open this building again full year up on and go back to the places that you sat over a year and a half ago. You're going to remember exactly which pew is yours, which spot is yours, and that's where you're going to be because we're creatures of habit. One time I was driving past a church that had a changeable sign, and I looked up and I said amen as I drove by because it said the only people who truly embrace change are wet babies. The rest of us like things the way we're used to. But if we want to experience Pentecost, we have to be open to where the Holy Spirit is going to pick us up and where the Holy Spirit might put us down. We have to be open to the possibilities of ministry that the Spirit will open to us through the power that comes into us, through the paraclete, who is our advocate, who has come alongside of us, who is our counselor, our comforter, our intercessor, and our defender, the one who comes to make all things, even us, new. I took the title of the sermon, and I don't know if it got on the board, didn't get in the thing. It was called, Today We Too Stand Ready. I took that from the, the song that Elaine sang. I want you to listen to those words again. And today we too stand ready for the power to descend, to feel a touch from heaven and that mighty rushing wind. A mighty rushing wind, a mighty rushing wind. Revive us with your spirit, Lord, we pray. Do we really mean that? Do we want to be open to the Spirit wherever the Spirit takes us, whatever the Spirit tells us to do, wherever the Spirit may lead us? The Spirit has led some folks in our congregation to other nations to proclaim the gospel. The Spirit has led some people from other nations to Cockeysville, Maryland to share in proclaiming the gospel with us. The Spirit might take you where you never thought you might go, and it only might be a block from the place where you live. Remember what I said? I was going to get back to the duck and cover business. Now, there are people who will try to define what it is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and next week we're going to look at what it is to be born again on Trinity Sunday, which follows Pentecost Sunday. Next Sunday we'll look at a little of that. But some people are so afraid of the Holy Spirit that they try to duck and cover. Because when the Spirit is poured out on all flesh, and when people have said to me, which a lot of people have, women should be silent in the church, I have said to somebody, because God put those words from this story from the prophecy of Joel into my mouth at the moment. The day shall come when I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. 
Your young men shall see vision, your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both male and female, I will pour my spirit, says the Lord God. So you can duck, folks, but you can't cover. Don't try to avoid the spirit when the spirit comes into your life. Now, a friend of mine who was in my youth group growing up at, at Texas Charge, we were in the youth group together there, and he felt a call to the ordained ministry, and he went to his campus group. He went to a campus ministry group. It was not a United Methodist group. It was a ecumenical group, and he said, I feel called to be a pastor. They said, you can't be a pastor because you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit because you don't speak in tongues. Because that for them was the only reason that he could. This was a man who was fluent in three or four other languages beside English, but because he didn't have that, that holy speech, that, that ecstatic utterance to God, they told him that he couldn't possibly be baptized because he didn't have the Holy Spirit. I interpreted once a service for one of my deaf members at a Pentecostal church where she and her husband attended without an interpreter. And the pastor said, we're all going to speak in tongues now. And he came up and he said, if you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, we want you to get in this line. If you need to be healed, get in this line. He came up and tapped me on the shoulder and he said, lady pastor, you might want to get into the line to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And everyone started speaking in tongues and I didn't have that gift of interpretation. I can interpret English into sign language and I did French once, which about set me back couple of years in my brain, but I couldn't interpret the tongues because that was not a gift I had been given. I believe people are given the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation, not one of mine. And I sat there and he said, we speak in tongues to confound the devil. Pastor, you might want to go get baptized by the Holy Spirit. We make those distinctions and that sometimes scares people from opening themselves fully to the Spirit because people say, I don't want to end up being one of those holy roller types. I don't want to be one of those people who's speaking words that don't make sense. And so when the Holy Spirit wants to come into our hearts, we say, no, thank you. I think I'll pass. You can duck, but you can't cover. Just like a tablecloth is not going to protect you from nuclear fallout. If the Spirit wants you, the Spirit's going to get you. I talked to so many people who share with me a call to ordain ministry, but they say, but I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. And I'll say, you can run, but you can't hide. And eventually, most of them end up going or spending a lifetime in regret. But don't be afraid. God's not going to call you necessarily to preach a sermon up here, but if God has called you to preach a sermon, let me know. We'll work that out. We'll work that in. But whatever God calls you to do, God will equip you to do. God does not call the equipped. God equips the called through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I hope you leave today going a little bit more Greek, paraclete, because we all need an advocate. We need someone who comes alongside us. We need a comforter. We need a counselor. We need a defender. We need someone to pray for us. We have that in Jesus Christ. We have that in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's a good thing that I'm going because now I will be with you always through the power of my spirit because I will be in you. I will be working through you. I will be spreading the story of Jesus Christ, redeeming love, through you, but you got to let God in. So Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Don't try to cover yourselves up, but let the Spirit in. To the glory of God and your Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank <laughs> you.